It is one of Idaho's incomparable places, a land of remarkable diversity and dramatic vistas, where white-hued mountains merge with the clouds. It's a huge treasure. It's an unbelievable, unique resource. But like a beautiful magnet, the inspiring boulder white clouds are attracting increasing numbers of visitors. It's hard to fit more people into a wild area and keep it wild. The gift that we could give to future generations is to protect this as congressionally designated wilderness. Yet for some people, wilderness is a word that means losing access to cherished ground. If a wilderness proposal goes through, it will exclude all of us from using this area. And what about the ranching families who have been here for generations? I'd hope that we could try to find a balance so that everybody would get what they want out of this beautiful country up here. A beautiful country awash in controversy where compromise seems just out of reach. The Boulder White Clouds, next on Outdoor Idaho. Funding for Outdoor Idaho is made possible by your contributions to the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. It seems so serene. It's hard to believe that this mountain was once the scene of one of the most contentious environmental battles in the state's history. And even after 30 years, those battles still continue. Hi, I'm Bruce Reichert and welcome to Outdoor Idaho. You know, there have been attempts to legislate a resolution, but they've all failed. But now there's a new attempt to find a final compromise to find common ground among all those who cherish this place called the Boulder White Clouds. Mile after mile, the mountains stretch onward, brooding, imposing, snow-capped peaks dominating the landscape. This is the Boulder White Clouds high country where more than 150 summits touch the clouds above 10,000 feet. Here, Castle Peak reigns supreme, demanding respect for its 11,815-foot mass. Nearby frozen lakes await the warm winds of summer to unveil their liquid beauty. Contorted rocks stained with multiple colors are reminders of the fiery volcanic past that helped mold this place millions of years ago. It's an amazing terrain that was further refined by sculpting glaciers, erosive winds, and time itself. It's really complex geology. On the east side of the White Clouds is mainly chalice volcanics. So a lot of different rock types, a lot of different types of forces going on. Really interesting geology. The white rock, like over here on David O. Lee Peak, is a limestone. And seen from a distance, the main white cloud peaks looks like big white clouds on the horizon. And from a distance, from that perspective, it really makes sense why they were called the white clouds. The Boulder White Clouds area contains a 500,000 acre swath of central Idaho that remains mostly roadless and essentially wild. From these rugged lands spring the waters of four rivers, the Big Wood, the Big Lost, the Salmon, and the East Fork of the Salmon. The East Fork meanders along a course that winds through the heart of the region, a massive area bordered on the west and north by Highway 75, and on the east and south by Highway 93 and Trail Creek Road. Only a limited number of mostly dirt roads penetrate the country in between. 
Most of those roads were established decades ago by miners. Over the years, the prospectors left multiple reminders of their far-reaching quests. Eventually, most mining operations in the White Clouds were abandoned. Even the largest and most successful, the Livingston Mine, is a rusting remnant of better days. A more recent mining claim thrust the White Clouds to the forefront of state politics. In 1968, the giant mining company Asarco proposed putting an open pit molybdenum mine at the base of Castle Peak. Politician Cecil Andrus joined with Ernie Day and other conservationists to oppose the mine. That position struck a chord, and in 1970, Andrus became Idaho's first Democratic governor in 25 years. In 1972, with Andrus and Frank Church leading the way, Congress established the 754,000-acre Sawtooth National Recreation Area. The SNRA not only stopped the mine at Castle Peak, it prohibited any new mining claims within its boundaries. And it also said existing claims could not impair scenic or wildlife values. While the SNRA included a new sawtooth wilderness, because of the mineral interests, the white clouds were labeled a wilderness study area. Over 30 years later, Despite multiple attempts at political compromise, final designation for the area is still unresolved. With competing interests and multiple users, finding that common ground is a challenge. And recreationists certainly have a variety of opinions about wilderness designation. Members of the Salmon River Snowmobile Club in Stanley say there's already more than enough wilderness in the area. For them, the white clouds are one of their favorite spots to spend time when the temperatures plummet and the mountains are covered in snow. Well, riding into the white clouds, we've seen a lot of spectacular country in here that you otherwise wouldn't be able to get to if you didn't snowmobile. You can hike up here in the summer, ride horses in here, and see it, but it's completely different in the winter. It's unlike anything else you'll see. It's just so spectacular. You get back in these peaks and you just are amazed that you're here. We're just really lucky that we can get back here and see this country. These riders relish their winter excursions here and contend their machines have little lasting impact. Our motto is our tracks don't last. We'll come in and uh, with the new snowfall, you can't tell we've been here. When the snow melts off, you'll never know we were here. Regardless of impact, motorized recreation would not be allowed in any area designated as wilderness. That's a big reason most snowmobilers don't want any changes in the way the white clouds are being managed. The state has four million acres of wilderness right now. We as a state association don't believe we need any more. This particular area has been well managed for 25 years under a plan in place. The way it is right now is working out very good. There's something here for everyone. We care for this area. We love it. We spend our winters here, we spend our summers here, and uh, I just hate to see it go away. Sean Peterson and Stephen Walcher also love the White Clouds. But their sport is backcountry skiing. It's a demanding pastime that requires solid conditioning, especially for the rigorous trips these two enjoy. They've been through the entire White Cloud range several times in the middle of winter. That's a feat few others have accomplished. It's just this wonderful journey where we spend eight to ten days and we rely on our skills, carry our own food and be resourceful. It's a refuge from all the craziness that's going on in the world. I've been through the white clouds six times and I never get tired of them. Every year I go over those ridges and I'm just going, wow, wow, wow. I just never get tired of it. It's unreal. Half of why I come out here is to share it with people. 
it basically blows their mind how nice it is. It's just quiet, and I love it. It is that search for silence that can lead to conflicts between skiers and snowmobilers. Many skiers here savor winter solitude so much that they'd like to see it safeguarded, protected by a White Clouds Wilderness designation. You know, I come out here to ski, but the downhill part of it's a bonus. I mean, the big part is being able to pull off the road and pull your skis out and walk around in the mountains and have quiet and clean fresh air and untrack snow and get away from the mechanized world that we live in. The mountains aren't about motors and people on big powerful machines. It's about walking around and listening to the wind and looking at animal tracks and experiencing nature. They need to protect our lands and protect our wildlife. These are our lands, everybody's lands, and some uses are more impactful than others. Protecting and managing these lands is the job of the Forest Service, the BLM, and several other federal agencies. But it's a complex and difficult task. Part of the Boulder White Clouds is in the SNRA. Other areas are included within the National Forest. Some is BLM land. And in the center of the region, along the East Fork of the Salmon River, are private ranches with grazing allotments that extend well into the public lands in the surrounding mountains. Members of the Baker family own several of these ranches. The first Bakers came here in the late 1800s, and for well over a century, the ranching tradition has flourished in this valley. Dick Baker grew up in a modest log cabin just down the road from his current residence. And in his pasture, three generations of bakers, including Dick, his son Wayne, and granddaughter Ashley, are doing what East Fork ranchers have done for decades. Wayne's wife, Melody, loves the ranching lifestyle. As a former Custer County commissioner, she understands politics and the pressure on ranchers today. It gets into a tug of war and it's just adding more conflict and that's not working for anyone and it's not a fun way to live. If you could keep it like it is right now, that would be about as perfect as you can get. Of course you can't, more and more people are coming so we need to be very careful. Everybody wants open space and we have all of that, but we have it because people have worked so hard to take care of it. If you take them out of that, you're gonna change the very thing that people want to come up here and see. Working with federal agencies has become a way of life for East Fork ranchers as they deal with grazing conflicts, habitat for spawning salmon, wolves, and other issues. This year, as part of the annual Chalice Experimental Stewardship Program, ranchers, federal land and wildlife managers, congressional representatives, and conservationists all got together for a ride into the White Clouds. They were taking a closer look at the conflicts that can occur when cattle and recreational users mix. Of course, dealing with these kinds of issues is what this gathering is all about. The stewardship program was formed in the mid-70s to provide an opportunity for grassroots groups to get together, discuss issues on resource management, this seems to be the most successful way to do it and gets everybody together. We can actually talk more freely and bring up new ideas, discuss things that are a problem, and it is a very useful atmosphere to create that dialogue. Sid Doughton is another East Fork rancher who stopped in at the gathering. He's trying to find common ground with federal land managers and conservation groups, but is uncertain about the future. I would like to stay in the ranching business, but uh, with the controversies with the, the fish and the wolves and, and uh, recreation, it's more difficult. There's just too many driving forces to eliminate ranching on the East Fork and maybe even eliminate ranching here in the West. Doughton says compromises like conservation easements or land exchanges might help keep ranchers in business but some groups want total buyouts. And for many ranching families, that's not a reasonable option. People wouldn't be here six generations if they were in it for the money. 
You know, they love this country, and it wouldn't matter how much money you gave them. It's about the land, and they love it, and they want to take care of it. That's what makes this place so special. The East Fork is so special, there's a vigorous debate about what land use is most appropriate here. A group called Western Watersheds Project are clear opponents of grazing on public lands. They acquired one of the ranches in the valley and are retiring the grazing allotment. They also brought in volunteers to plant native vegetation so they could return the ranch to a more natural state. The Green Fire Preserve is intended to show what this area was like before the European settlement came with the native grasses, flowers, shrubs, and trees that were here before, and especially to provide habitat for the numerous wildlife in the area. It's a critical way to show individuals can make a difference in maintaining and restoring wilderness values, even on private land. I think that ranching is really not compatible on public lands in the East Fork watershed. Wildlife protection, water quality, all these things are more important than traditional lifestyles that have not been compatible. Hester County Commissioner Cliff Hansen thinks traditional lifestyles are compatible with other values. He thinks plans to help the area's economy and resolve conflicts could help locals continue to live here. Hopefully there will be a chance if everybody will use a little common sense and don't get greedy and look at a little compromise and try to understand each other's position, then there might be a chance that this would work out and work out real good. And, and it would be very positive for Custer County. Yet it's hard to predict what compromises will really move the process forward. Lynn Stone, director of a conservation group called the Boulder White Clouds Council, knows there are no easy answers. She often talks to groups about issues involving wolves, wildlife, and wilderness. And she's also personally explored much of the area and has written a book about hiking in the White Clouds. There's no place else in Idaho that has this beautiful, white, stunning ridge. It just takes your breath away. When you see it for the first time, you think this isn't even real. This is like a painting. How can you fly over Castle Peak and not want to protect it? How can you hike into Fourth of July or Chamberlain Basin and not want to keep it that way forever? The gold here right now is recreation, and the conflicts we're having now are over what type of recreation is going to be the future. We've got to protect wilderness where it is and the boulder white clouds are just spectacular. And to let a handful of folks who have to be riding a machine wherever they go to stop that from being protected for all the generations to come, I, I just think that's unacceptable. Of course, those on the machines strongly disagree. They think there's already enough protection for the area and say most riders are very careful about staying on trails. This group includes members of the Blue Ribbon Coalition and the Idaho Trail Machine Association. Some of them have been riding in the White Clouds for nearly 40 years. They point out they've worked hard to maintain the trails over that time because it's such a great place to ride. Really enjoy this area. It's some of the primo trail bike riding in the country, I believe, and it's really special. I think that we could probably compromise with the wilderness advocates and have some wilderness in the boulder white clouds, but you know there's a lot of trails that we've got a long term investment in and we're willing to work with those guys on something that meets some of their needs as long as they're willing to meet us at least halfway and leave the trails open that we've been using all these years. I think it should be left as a multi-use area and everybody can enjoy it. Because there's older people that come up here that would never be able to hike. You get up to some of the, the overlooks and you feel like you're on top of the world. I want to have that opportunity to show my kids this area and show my grandkids. Mel Qualley applauds attempts to resolve the issues in the White Clouds. And though he's optimistic about the long run, 
he thinks finding a final solution will be difficult. It's going to be a tough sell to be able to get all sides happy, but eventually there will be a compromise. So it's just a matter of being able to accommodate people. That's really what our forests are about. It's about how will the American people be able to use them and enjoy them and keep them for forever. How people use the boulder white clouds is incredibly varied. From motorized recreation to mountain biking, horseback riding, backpacking, hiking and fishing, there are many ways to enjoy this captivating country. SNRA Recreation Manager Ed Kennedy has witnessed the upsurge of activity in these mountains. He has the difficult assignment of trying to keep the different groups satisfied. That's the hardest part of my job is at the root of the problems that we have managing this place. A big problem is just the crush of use overall. A lot of people are coming here. We work really hard to try to have the right balance of opportunities. And of course, there are people who would contend that we, that we don't. But, you know, for the most part, people seem to come here and have a really good time. It's really hard not to be inspired. It's hard not to say, you know, this is a special place. For me, it's important to enable people to come enjoy this place. There's little doubt this group from the Idaho Conservation League enjoys spending time in the white clouds. It's a place of beauty. It's a place of solitude. And those of us in Idaho that are lucky enough to live here, we're looking ahead to prevent problems, and we're looking to say this is an incredibly great spot, and we're proud of it. It's important to me and to our members to be able to go places where you can hear the wind in the trees. There need to be some places that are quiet and offer these opportunities for solitude that are so important for so many Americans who own these lands together. Like many others who spend time here, these people have developed a special bond with the Boulder White Clouds. They feel the best way to protect this place is to push for wilderness designation. I think often what happens to wild land in wild country is it gets chipped away at, and without knowing it, we lose areas to either industrial development or just the mechanization of the world. In the big scale of things, 95% of the United States is already roaded and accessible to motorized equipment. We can't make wilderness in other places, and Idaho is unique enough that we still have the opportunities to save the wilderness that's left. It's been a generation since any wilderness was designated in Idaho, and there are millions of acres eligible for that kind of protection. I think we've all shown on all sides that we're good at gridlock. Now we need to figure out how can we move forward and actually come to some kinds of agreement on how to protect some of the places. For several years, Congressman Mike Simpson has been working to resolve not only the wilderness question, but the many other complex issues confronting the Boulder White Clouds. He's been talking to everyone from county commissioners to conservation groups. Simpson is trying to craft a bill that creates some wilderness, yet also considers the needs of rural economies, motorized recreation, and ranchers. In 1999, I've suggested to you that uh, protecting the Boulder White Clouds and other areas was important to me. We have been working on it since then. What you've got to do is try to bring people together and try to put together some type of plan which has some benefit for everyone involved. During this appearance at the Idaho Conservation League's annual gathering, Simpson ran into another politician who has dealt extensively with wilderness legislation, former Governor Cecil Anders. The two have talked a number of times about the challenges involved in trying to bring all sides to the table. I think he's on the right track. I know he's sincere. The point is we all have to work towards a common goal. Now, that means I got to give a little here, he's going to give a little here, the livestock industry will give a little, the off-road vehicle people will give a little, and we'll work it out. But you've got to get those people at the table. 
Undoubtedly, those who do come to the table will arrive with opinions. Yet they will also bring a deep appreciation for this place. Though people may use these mountains and valleys in very different ways, there is widespread admiration for the unique qualities found here. And though different groups are split on how to best protect this land, they likely agree it needs to be preserved in some way. Whether that common passion for the white clouds is enough to foster a lasting compromise remains to be seen. But it's certain that spending time in the bolder white clouds will leave a lasting impression on all those who experience its majesty. Funding for Outdoor Idaho is made possible by your contributions to the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. All Outdoor Idaho programs are available on video cassette, including hour-long specials called Idaho Edens, Gold Rush Days in Ghost Towns, and Idaho and Angler's Paradise. To order, call our toll-free number. For more details about this show, and other Idaho Public Television offerings, look for us on the World Wide Web.